Hello, my name is Father Gregory Pine, and I am a Dominican friar of the province of St. Joseph, and this is Pines with Aquinas. I got a question recently that I thought was interesting, and so I'm sharing it with you, and the question is this. Okay, Father Gregory, sin is evil. Evil is a privation, which is like a fancy word for a conspicuous lack or a conspicuous absence, that is to say, what ought to be there but isn't. And so when you sin, you kind of undo yourself, or you choose to be less than you ought, or could be. So can we say that the state of damnation for those who have sinned to such an extent as to be excluded from the presence of God, that it effectively mounts to non-being, and those people pass out of existence, and so they are spared the torments and tortures of hell because they are no longer? I said, interesting question. Ultimately, the response is, wait a sec, you got to keep watching to find out. Okay, so this question gets a couple things right and it gets a couple things wrong. So let's work through them, clarify, and come to a deeper appreciation of God and of his dealings with the world. So first off, the instinct about, about evil is right. So it's traditional in the Catholic Church, or it's present within the Catholic tradition, to define evil as a privation of the good. So you find this in very powerful fashion in like St. Augustine or in St. Thomas Aquinas. And a privation means just what I said it means, in the sense that there's a conspicuous lack or um, a kind of conspicuous absence, as it were. So a privation names something that ought to be there, but isn't there. And you can feel it because it's not there. Or you can perceive that something is wrong. As my dad would say, not all is right at Red Rock. He's certainly quoting somebody, I just don't know who it is. So all my quotations are derivative. Here we go. So Think about an example in the natural order, like, like blindness, for instance. All right, so let's say that one of your best friends is blind. In that event, you know that there is something wrong in the sense that this person ought to be able to see. Whether they were blind from birth, they suffered some kind of accident or some degenerative condition, regardless of which, you know that this person ought to be able to see by virtue of the fact that this person is a human person. And it's part of what it means to be a human person. It's part of human nature to be able to see. So when this person is blind, you lament it. Now, we can make subsequent judgments and say like, this person lost his sight, for instance, and yet the person came to a deeper appreciation of the vision of God, okay, so a kind of paradoxical change. But that's still, that's a, that's a subsequent judgment. In the first judgment, we just say, this is not good, this is bad. Doesn't mean that you're less of a person in the sense like you can't attain to the same state or dignity or level of holiness, not saying that. I'm just saying you should be able to see. That's all we're saying with the privation. Okay, now, welcome to Washington, D.C. There are policemen driving past on the highway all the time. Okay, so then let's talk about it then in the order of supernature, in the order of grace. So we can say, for instance, that apostasy is a privation, okay? Because for a person who has accepted the gift of faith, that person ought to continue believing, and that person ought to continue to make acts of faith, and so grow the habit of faith, the virtue of faith, to its term, which is the vision of God in heaven. You see that I've chosen two things which are related. But when you commit the sin of apostasy, you chase faith from your heart. All right, so the virtue of faith has to be attacked head on. So when you commit a mortal sin, you lose the virtue of charity, but you don't necessarily lose the virtue of faith because uh, you can have unformed faith or dead faith. So, but in the instance of a, a sin contrary to faith, like infidelity or like heresy or like apostasy or blasphemy or blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, um, then we're dealing with something that can chase the virtue of faith from your heart. Okay, so that's what we mean by privation. Now, Whenever we talk about a privation, we talk about it as in something. So Aristotle will say that being can be said in many ways. And he sets up a kind of horizontal analogy of being. He says when we say being, in the first place we mean like substances, like things, like rocks and um, Venus flytraps and orangutans and human beings and angels. Okay, so when we talk about substance, we're talking about a particular thing, that to which pertains to substand, right, to stand under. And then he says... Next, we mean accidents, okay? And you're familiar with this language from learning about the Eucharist, uh, but if you're not too fresh up on it, an accident is a thing that inheres in a substance. So it's like a quantity or a quality or a relation or an action or a passion or a habit or a posture or what, you know, so different ways in which it's conditioned, the substance is conditioned. It's this tall or it's this fat or it's this green, or it's this young, or it's to the left of that, or it's the daughter of that, or it's whatever, okay? 
So that's being, but it's being in a lesser sense than substance, or it's being in a narrower sense or a constrictor sense. I just said constrictor. Oh yeah. And then he says next, maybe maybe we could think about privations because there's a kind of being there insofar as it signals what ought to be, but is in fact not. But already we're making a judgment about a nature which is present, okay? And then he'll say negations would be at the other end of the spectrum, which is just to say not, okay? So just not, rather than making reference to what ought to be there, but isn't. So there's, there's some reference to being in privation. And the way that this works in the practical order is that a privation always inheres in something. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, like blindness is in the person who ought to see, and apostasy is in the person who denies the faith, and so too of other evils. They inhere in something. Now, you might start brainstorming ideas as to like, okay, but what if the whole universe is destroyed? Great question. And John Crosby asks this question in an article that he wrote, suggesting that privation of the good might not be the best definition, but there are also compelling responses to that type of argumentation. We're going to keep moving. Okay, so in the case of our sinner, when we talk about evil or sin, we're, we're always talking about a sin which is perpetrated by an individual, which gives rise to a vice which inheres in an individual. All right, so it always presumes a nature. It always presumes something from which this ought to be there is absent. All right, so it names someone in whom the conspicuous absence or the conspicuous lack inheres. Um, so, so practically speaking, you can never destroy yourself totally. Now, there are cool practical consequences of this fact, too. So like St. Thomas will say, for instance, that the natural law can never be wholly blotted out from the heart of man. So there's no person who has yet breath within him or her, um, I'm mixing up my M's and my N's, <laughs> who has yet breath within him or her, uh, who is not capable of conversion. So you hear this for instance, in one of G.K. Chesterton's Father Brown stories named, I think, The Queer Feet, where he says, you know, God is such, or the mercy of God is such that he permits us to wander the very edge of the world, only to be pulled back by a twitch upon the thread, and then that's reprised in Brideshead Revisited. So you always remain capable of God, provided that you have a human nature, which you do. And here's the thing. God does not return your nature to nothing. God does not decreate you. God does not annihilate you. And it's not because like you have rights over God, because in the strict sense, we don't. But God, uh, he honors his word, all right? So God is consistent, or God is true to himself. And insofar as he expresses his, created, his creative intent at the outset, you know, at the beginning of your life, so he continues to see that creative intent through. So we say, for instance, that God is omnipresent. So God is present to all of creation, and he's present to us, uh, regardless of whether or not we're in a state of grace, by virtue of the fact that he gives us being, right? That he gives us, you know, acting, as it were, or doing, uh, and that we're transparent to his gaze. Now, God wants to dwell in you more intimately by the life of grace and eventually by the life of glory, which is the perfection or full realization of grace in the life of heaven. But some people chase that life of grace. Uh, they chase that life of glory from their interior heart of hearts, and they consign themselves to the pits of, you know, the damned. Now, we don't make judgments as to particular particular individuals being there or not being there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, we, we admit the possibility of damnation. And, you know, many people in the tradition thought that lots of people went to hell. Um, and so it's only like recently that that notion has been, you know, kind of challenged by modern and contemporary theologians. So it seems that there are souls who retain their nature in whom inheres sins and vices, who reject God up until the moment of their death, and then are consigned to a place which we would refer to as hell. So despite their best efforts at a kind of decreation or auto-annihilation, they do not succeed in you know, putting themselves out of existence, and God does not put them, in, put them out of existence, because that really wouldn't represent a mercy, because it's inconsistent with the divine nature, and the divine nature is love, right? So God's creative intent, his recreative intent, is always a deliverance of love, and we have to be able to, aff to affirm that from the pits of hell to the heights of heaven, which is a really challenging thing to do, but we have to confront it, because if there's something intelligible there, then you know, there's going to be a certain access granted, provided that we're thinking well about it, that God affords us a certain grace to inquire further. Um, so, yeah, it's an interesting thought, but I think there's just a couple of problems there that we need to address. And in working them out, we come to discover that, that no, while sin does have kind of decreative tendencies, uh, we can't speak about it as a decreation in the strict sense, okay? 
Uh, so it's a violence against one's created nature, certainly a violence against one's graced nature that causes a kind of perversion which reduces one to such a state of poverty and wretchedness that one becomes old, almost wholly unrecognizable as a human being, but still remains a human being created by God and loved by God at a certain level, even in the depths of hell. So there you have it, folks. All right, this is Pines with Aquinas. If you haven't yet, please do subscribe to the channel, push the bell, get email updates when other cool things happen. Um, also, check out God's Planning, a podcast to which I contribute with four of the Dominican Friars with sweet weekly episodes, which are short, which seems contrary to the tendency of many podcasts in this day and age. And then come to the National Rosary, nope, Dominican Rosary Pilgrimage at the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception to be hosted on September 30th here in Washington, D.C. So I'm giving a couple talks. We're having mass. We're praying the rosary. There's going to be adoration, confessions, opportunity to go out for lunch. And you get to yeah meet some of the friars whom you've come to know through this, that, and the other thing. To Mystic Institute, God's Planning, and more things besides. So I hope to meet you there. And uh, please do stop me. Say hello. Introduce yourself. And uh, look forward to uh, praying together. Cool. That's what I got for you. Until the next time, know of my prayers for you. Please pray for me. And I look forward to chatting again on Pints with Aquinas.